Welcome to TFP, the Theater Folk Podcast, the place to be for drama teachers, drama students, and theater educators everywhere. I'm Lindsay Price, resident playwright for Theater Folk. Hello! I hope you're well. Thanks for listening. Welcome to episode 138. You can find any links to this episode in the show notes at theaterfolk.com forward slash episode 138. So uh, today we continue talking to teachers in our successes and challenges series. Uh, I love this. I love doing these interviews. It's inspiring to me and I hope it's inspiring to you too as the school year kicks into gear. So in this episode, we hear from a teacher using students as leaders, a successful fundraiser. Don't we all want to know about that? And everyone's favorite challenge turned success Shakespeare. Uh, So maybe you too. Yes, you. I'm talking to you. You know who you are. Hi, how are you? So maybe you too can take on a challenge that everyone is saying you can't do. And we are going to do it. Let's do it. All right. I am speaking to Christy Jacobs. Hello, Christy. Hi. Um, How are you tonight? I'm doing wonderful. How about you? I'm doing pretty good. Doing pretty good. So we are talking about uh, successes and challenges. So what has been your challenge this year? Um, I would say my challenge this year has been um, getting parents involved in a way that is um, helpful and productive. Uh, I graduated um, about a not last year, but the year before, I graduated a really strong group of seniors who had I had parents that were taking care of a lot of things, and then we didn't really have um, the the parents coming in underneath them so much um, to sort of uh, min- be mentored by them. Yeah. So I've had I've had a, I had a year of of real transition, and then this year there are some parents that are slowly starting to step up, um, but just it, it's kind of overwhelming, you know, doing when you're a one woman show getting everything done so you really have to rely on those parents and I think the kids too are just involved in so much so then the parents are involved in so much and it's hard to really get them to dedicate a lot of time you realize you realize how much of a one-man band you are when that parent support sort of disappears doesn't it (laughs) oh absolutely absolutely um and then you know you do and then and I will say I do have some parents that are are really wonderful and always asking what they can do, um, but sometimes it's really hard to to tell them what they can do. Um, and I had, you know, I had those parents that had been been around for you know five years. Our our school is at eighth grade through twelfth grade, um, and so they could just do everything, you know. And I didn't have to think about telling them what to do, you know. They just did it. Um, and so it's finding that way of of communicating with them exactly what they can do to help and be helpful and um, sort of get what needs to be done done well sometimes the the worst question that you can the worst thing that can be thrown your way is oh just let me know if i can do anything to help it's like yes but i don't know what that is and you don't want to lose them exactly exactly it's in and, and, you know and i definitely there are definitely um some wonderful parents out there that yes that for all the time um but sometimes it's just you're in you're just going from thing to thing you know got to figure out what this prop is going to be and how you're going to make it work. And um, you don't know how to communicate what it needs to be to them to get them to do it, you know? Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on how you're going to handle this next year? Yeah, I do. Um, I actually think I'm going to sort of, I'm going to, I do, like I said, I have a couple parents that are, are really great about asking to help. So I think I'm going to try to to get them to sort of um, create sort of like a, a boost parent booster club type thing uh, where they're kind of in charge of the parents, you know, a parent in charge of the parents um, and kind of that way I can just have one person that I communicate what sort of the needs are and, you know, the top priorities and, and what needs to be done and then have them be in charge of communicating with the parents and getting the things done. Because I think that's another challenge is um, finding you know, because I have so much on my plate, finding that time to communicate with the parents even, you know, in, in a way that is uh, sort of productive. Yeah. Um, so I think if there's, an, if there's someone else that can be in charge of that, 
of getting of you know sending those emails out and making the phone calls and getting the list together i think that would be really helpful so that's sort of my my plan going forward for next year i think that's an awesome idea you know so that way it's a it's sort of a it's a funnel that 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 you're not at the end of you're at the beginning of it yes exactly okay so let's talk about your success what was your success this year um, well, we, for the first time, did a um, faculty one-act performance, and this was our fundraiser this year, our big fundraiser this year. Um, it is an idea that I kind of got about, you know, about two years ago. This is my fifth year at um, the school, and um, I haven't really had, it sort of came from a, um, uh, I don't know, a, a a selfish place. Um, I haven't really had a chance to perform <laughs> too much um, because I'm always directing. So um, I was like, gosh, how can I get myself on stage and still, you know, not, you know, stretch myself way too thin? And, um, and you know, it's always, fundraisers are always such a challenging thing because you put so much work into them. And then the amount of money that you make really isn't always very much worth the amount of work that you put into them. So I got this idea, and then the timing was just right this year um, to give it a go, and basically uh, put out uh, feelers to the to the faculty and staff, and said, you know, would you audition for a one act play? And a lot of them were saying, yeah, 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 and the kids were all about it. So my officers, um, they did the auditions, they auditioned all of us, and they did the casting, and then I kind of mentored. Um, mainly it was my president and vice president, mostly the president mentored her in kind of directing the show. Um, and it was super successful. We, uh, we, you know, I, we really didn't spend much on it all. We spent and paid for the rights for the play and the scripts. And that was pretty much as far as the expenses went because uh, we chose a script that really didn't need a set. Um, and uh, we had, uh, you know, most of the costume stuff already we just pulled from our stock and props we just pulled from our stock or borrowed. Uh, so we really didn't spend very much money. So it was all profit. That's awesome. And I mean, that's sometimes... All, all students want is to see their teachers in a different light, you know, and what a fun thing, what a fun way to do it. Absolutely. Oh, they, they loved it, you know, and, the, and it was, I tried really hard to find a script that obviously was going to be funny and um, also had a lot of parts. So there were, I think we had 20 teachers Holy that cow. were, um, that were in it. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and, you know, the way the script was set up was, it was like, scenes there was like four main parts that were always there and then there was a fifth part there was like I don't know like over a dozen scenes like that um and so the fifth person would come in and do their thing and leave so it was really great because you know teachers were all very busy we don't have a lot of time to rehearse and such so it was really easy to set up the rehearsals um because not everyone had to be there Uh, and it was kind of as a teacher was available we would you know meet and block and rehearse and and it really worked out well. How long uh, How long would you say your rehearsal process was? It was not very long at all. It was about, I would say, two and a half weeks or so. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe maybe three weeks. Um, it was really short. Uh, and, and like I said, it was mainly after school, um, usually not longer than an hour, an hour and a half after school. And it was who could come, whoever could come that day would come. Um, there were a couple of teachers where they really only rehearsed like um, maybe t- maybe once or twice before our like dress rehearsal. And when recruiting the teachers, I basically said there are two days you absolutely must be available. And it was the show day and the day before the show. And I was like, other than that, it's completely flexible. So as long as they were available the you know, day before the show so we could do a, a dress rehearsal tech type thing um, and then the day of the show. What a great, uh, what a great um, faculty you must have that they just like basically jumped in with both feet. Oh, yeah. We do have a really wonderful faculty. We really do. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm very thankful for that. Um, what, a, and- what a great idea for your and for your drama students to see, too. I, I, you know, like uh, I think that's something that uh, if you're looking for a, a, an interesting fundraiser idea, you know, See you with the faculty, short rehearsal period, fun play, um, and, um, and just, uh, 
you make it entertaining, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. And and like you said before, the kids really love seeing their teachers do things that their teachers don't normally do. Um, and especially if you could make yourself look silly for them, you know, they they really eat it up. Um, and uh, and and I think you know. This was our first year doing it, and uh, we didn't sell out, but we got pretty close to selling out. And I think that next year, it'll probably be sold out. And that's another thing. We only did one performance, and um, and that was it. One and done. (laughs) Yeah. So, Well, maybe you've started a tradition. I think so. You know, everyone, it it was definitely the buzz around school, and people were excited by it. So I think that, uh, I think that we're gonna we're gonna keep it going. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much, Christy. I, that was really uh, I really love those. Uh, um, I love that fundraiser idea, and it's always great to share a challenge. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Hello, Liz. Hello, Lindsay. I am talking to Liz Norling. Okay, let's get right to it. What has been your biggest challenge this year? My biggest challenge has been using 7th and 8th graders as leaders uh, backstage. I am typically a control freak type of director, and I've had a hard time um, letting go of some details. I've been predominantly a um, parent-assisted program. I get a lot of help through parents, a lot of support of parents, but I've really noticed an emergence of young leaders among my junior hires and have really felt like it was time to spread that out a little bit and allow them to get their fingerprints on the production a little bit more. So how did you do that? Well, it started with a young student who really wanted to um, be a stage manager. She was really interested in that because we had learned about it in uh, our junior high drama class. I did a unit on on um, tech theater, and they all got to kind of study their favorite thing, and that's something that she looked at and felt like it was an opportunity that she wanted to go for instead of actually auditioning for the play. And I thought, that's pretty cool. So I gave her some more information, and she actually self-taught herself. This is an eighth grader, um, read up on it, and got a notebook together. And she, she was a very organized young lady, and she just started taking advantage of that situation. Um, and then kids saw that, and they went, I really like what Victoria did. Can I try that next time? And then I thought, well, they all can't be as great as Victoria. No, I don't, I know, no, I'm not ready to let go of that yet. And then when we did our next show, I had about eight kids say they didn't want to audition for the show. And that scared the daylights out of me. I thought, I'm not going to have any quality eighth graders in the cast because they all want to work backstage. And so, It turned out to not be that way. I had plenty of people in the cast. And these kids, what I did was I put them through an interview process. I made it super serious for them. And I asked them really, really basic questions like, what do you know about stage management? Or what do you know about house managing? And then after they answered that question, I said something like, and what would make you a great stage manager? What would make you a great house manager or whatever? And it sort of went that way um, with about eight or nine kids that I got to interview. I think that's awesome uh, to, first of all, that, okay, if you want to do it, let's take it seriously. Let's, let's figure out what you know. As scary as it is, I, what a wonderful thing for students to learn and to be put in a, in a, in a position of authority. Absolutely. It could be a scary thing for junior hires because, you know, as you know, they're 12 and 13 years old. Um, so I do believe that it's that age where they really want to emerge as leaders and they don't yet aren't ready to be led, if that makes any sense. Yeah. It's a lot easier for them to be a leader than it is to take direction from a peer at that age group. Huh. So that was a little bit scary for me at first. I thought, I don't want a bunch of kids feeling like they're being bossed around. That wasn't my focus for this. It was more, my focus was more on the student leader and um, urging them on and bumping them up the next notch. It wasn't really for them to lord anything over the rest of the cast, if that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And did you have any, uh, did you have to do a balancing act with that? Were there some issues where students were like, I'm not taking uh, any notes from so-and-so? 
It started out that way because of some of the leaders who weren't yet ready to be leaders. Um, those were the kids that were still going to be in the show, but I had seen something in them during the interview where I felt like they weren't ready to take on that challenge yet. And I had seen things in their lives as students in my classroom. And so I told them, let's wait until the next time and we'll put you in. Those were the kids that struggled the most with leadership, but it didn't take long before they began to um, accept that leadership. And it, and it was a big thing for me to tell the kids, these students are here to put their hands on the backstage production element of it. They may tell you to pick up a set piece and move it, and it has nothing to do with them lording over leadership. I'm the big boss around here. And that kind of helped it bounce back into, okay, somebody is still in charge of all of this. And I'm not being led by a bunch of kids. And that's really important with that age group to keep that balance. So uh, it's kind of sounding like this was a, this is kind of your success as well as your challenge. Absolutely. I really felt like the, um, it's a great skill for kids to foster is that leadership. But not only that, there was this new appreciation for the work and the details that actually go into a production. Whereas before, if I'm just performing in a play, I show up at rehearsal. I really appreciate the performance aspect of it, but I don't really know the entire details that go on behind the scenes that make the whole thing come together. And I feel like there was a large enough group participating in that leadership part that absolutely grew um, my students. And it, it kind of was this thing that grew among the rest of the cast where they are now interested and now they have a passion for some of the work that goes on backstage. Oh, I just think that's awesome. And I think it's especially awesome at the middle school level. Like we're, mm. we are often told, you know, oh, they're too young. They're just kids. And it's like, no, they're, they're stepping into some roles. That's absolutely true. Um, there's a big part of it is remembering their age group and knowing, you know, they are 12 and 13. You can't send them on a task and assume that it's going to A, be completed uh, or B, that it's going to be completed the way that you want it to be. But if you can really hone in on that training piece of it and teaching them to see, to set a goal to see the end of that goal. And it may not come out the way you wanted it to. Um, I had them decorate the lobby for um, the show and hang up the headshots. And it wasn't the way I would do it, but they had done every single bit of it. And it was something that they could be proud of. Oh, lovely. Thank you so much, Liz. Mm -hmm. You are very welcome. Hello, Julie Gordon. Hello, Lindsay. How are you? Terrific. I'm really delighted to be talking to you right now about being a drama teacher. Oh, okay. Well, let's get into it. How long have you been a drama teacher? Oh, gosh, I guess about 10 years now. And uh, it was not my very first career, but I was always um, into theater. And I have an undergraduate degree in literature and theater from University of Pennsylvania and then an arts education degree and always had my eye on being a drama teacher. It just took some time to get there. And I'm just really delighted that I do what I do. So what was that? What was the switch that flipped for you? How did you right, make good, the decision? Good, yeah, good question. Well, a friend of mine um, who knew I had a background in theater, um, I was working actually, I had a, another wonderful job for a music production company, but I um, my friend who had been hired just to do a play, a middle school play, and she needed someone, she was a music teacher and she needed the theater piece. So she asked me if I would do that with her. And I said, absolutely. And we did a very creative circus version of every man. And I loved it. And I was pretty much hooked at that point. And then it sort of flowed from there. Well, of course, my ears pick up when I'm like, ooh, circus version of Everyman. Yes. I love yes. that. Love it. Yeah, it's very cool. It's very cool. It was actually an adaptation that my middle school drama teacher did, and I was in the play myself, and my friend oh who my asked gosh. me to direct with her. Yeah, it was a full circle thing. It was fun. Ah, that's lovely. Oh, I just get... I, it's so I get I feel very it's good that I'm sitting here alone when I do these because I just get I get this big grin on my face and I just <laughs> I love hearing about all this stuff. It's very, yeah, it's very goofy. OK, so now let's uh, so let's get into t we're talking successes and challenges. And I think we sh we need to end with the successes. So what's been sure, your what's sure what's been your challenge? 
Well, um, I guess um, a challenge has been um, we're in our, oh, toward the end of the year of our first year as a complete one-to-one iPad to student school. And not that I was worried or afraid of it, but I was just wondering how certain pieces of the curriculum uh, that I developed and also what would class time be like um, using and utilizing um, the, the iPad. And um, prior to that, um, in eighth grade, I do a monologue project. And I've always been organized about having a packet of monologues that I have already um, vetted and making sure that they're school appropriate and um, sort of the right length and that kind of thing. And I was always very, very vigilant. Like, you've got to pick a monologue from this pack. And then I realized that hey, maybe we can utilize the iPad and I can let the kids um, just go on the internet and maybe they can pick a monologue from their favorite TV show. Or maybe they can pick a monologue from a movie. And wouldn't it be nice if we could even find um, that monologue, um, a little video of it, and share that as well. And um, prior to coming to that realization, I thought, oh, I can't have the students look up their favorite TV show or their favorite movie because it's not from the theater. And I was becoming a very purist about that. And I think it was hard for some of the kids to connect with some of the monologues that I was choosing for them. And, and, And then, of course, it occurred to me, well, of course, they'll be much more engaged if they have the opportunity, if they don't like what's in the packet I've created, and sometimes they do, but give them the opportunity, the choice to find one of their own. And it went so much better. Uh, The kids were engaged and some of their favorite TV shows had wonderful monologues. Some movies were terrific. Um, Someone did pick the uh, Quint monologue from Jaws, which you had on one of your movie monologue Mondays. I remember seeing that at some point. So it really turned into a a much better unit. Uh, The kids certainly were way more enrolled um, of their own volition and, um, and really happy to coach each other. That's a big part of it as well. And again, going back to theater folk, uh, I do use some of your um, assessment rubrics for the monologue as well. So it it all sort of gelled and shaped together and became a a much more um, valuable experience for them. And they're scared enough as it is um, in this. This is a drama class that everybody uh, has to take. Um, It's part of our uh, rotation, which is mandatory. So I will have, of course, kids that love drama and have been doing it and have some experience. But all the way over on the other side, I'll have kids who have never spoken in front of their class before. So by giving them the choice and the opportunity, having them work in pairs and having them feel comfortable about looking for their own monologue and finding something that they really relate to and already like, it's going to be a much more successful unit, which is what happened in the end. Well, you, you're bringing up a, a, a bunch of stuff, which is what we have to ask ourselves when we're using drama in an educational setting. Like, what's the purpose? And I think that you've just hit it on the, on the head. The purpose is engagement. The purpose is like working together, connection. And I think by giving them a little bit of control, like that's not a that's not a bad thing to make a, to give them control over a choice. Absolutely, I think that's so true. And to to get them to feel comfortable about what they're doing and to understand that. Not everybody's going to be starting from the same place, and that's fine. And working with each other and giving, you know, doing that collaboration um, in such a creative, free form sort of uh, beginning where it's like, okay, find your monologue, you know, then they learn a lot about each other. They learn a lot about themselves. And for the student that's never spoken in front of their class, much less taken a, taken. Um, a look at a monologue in scripted form um, and having to perform it in front of their class, you know, it it does go much, much smoother and it is a much more enriching multi-layered experience for them. Yeah, absolutely. Well, not only that, now you're also adding in the technology layer that we're all supposed to uh, incorporate into the curriculum. That's absolutely right. That's that's true. That's true. We have this wonderful, wonderful technology. Everybody has a device, and how and 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 you know, in seconds, 
we can bring up this monologue and generally you can find it in a script format. If not, you can always uh, transpose it. But then we also have the the video or you know from the film the snippet from the film the monologue from the film or the monologue from the tv show and i can project it in two seconds and we're all on the same page we're all looking at this monologue and then we have a much better sense of what the challenge is for the actor and how we can support them to get into their character to do some of the background work on this character to to make them feel comfortable in creating their performance. Yeah, absolutely. Whereas we didn't have that before we had the iPads. Yeah, it's really I think that's a really good question to put out to everybody. You know, like what does what does being and I'm not and I'm I, there's lots of things that I'm a, a theater purist on, but how how much does it when are we hindering the success of our students and when are right. we helping them? Right, right. When are, when are we sort of putting the brakes on their create creativity yeah. and on their imagination? It's, it's so true. It really, really is true. And my goal is for everyone to feel comfortable or, or you know, I shouldn't say that. They definitely are. I want them to come out of their comfort zone, but I want them to feel capable, I guess is what I'm saying, and feel like they have the tools they need and that they're going to be able to go through this journey of creating this piece and they're going to come out just fine. Yeah. And they really did that. I was so proud of them. Um, I had, like I said, I had uh, one of the students did that wonderful monologue from Jaws. Another student did a monologue from How I Met Your Mother, where uh, the character of Marshall is describing his search to find, again, the perfect hamburger that he had. Um, and it was just wonderful. Um, and someone did a monologue uh, from One Tree Hill. And so, you know, when they, when, they, when they feel comfortable with the material, when they can relate to the material and then make it their own, I think it's a successful uh, unit, a successful experience for them. Well, that kind of sounds like, was this your, this is your challenge and your success? And my challenge was, how am I going yeah. to make this monologue project really relatable for these kids? How are they going to feel more comfortable getting involved in it and, and really be able to make it their own? And that was the challenge. And then when I knew we were going to have the iPads and I knew that I could say, hey, I, if you can't find a monologue or you don't don't want to use one from a television show or a film, you have the packet. If you don't want to use the packet, let's go on the internet and let's search for one. It can come from a TV show, a film, or you can also look up other monologues. So it was, it was really a great, a great solution to sort of a problem that I had teaching the unit. Awesome, Julie. That was such a great. That's a great exercise. I, I, I'm really, uh, I'm really thrilled that uh, we were able to get that out there. Yeah. Well, thanks, and you know, thanks for your materials, which always support my monologue project and and various other things that we also do um, in our drama class. We will keep on keeping on, right? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Hello, Daniel. Hi. Hi, I'm talking to Daniel Gray Beal. And uh, so let's get right into it. What has been your biggest challenge this year? Well, the, the biggest challenge we faced this year was um, doing a, an original adaptation of a Shakespeare play. Um, our area had not done anything Shakespeare since I was in high school. And actually, the last one we did was Macbeth. Um, and that's been probably... 16 to 18 years ago um, and we were really lucky to get 50 people in the audience because in our area Shakespeare is just not it, it, it people are afraid of it um, but we really wanted to do something with it we figured that was something that still required reading for all of our seniors and but I knew if I put the traditional Shakespeare on stage we wouldn't get them in the door um, they're just they're afraid of it they get so like tangled up in the language that they never they never see what's going on in the story or enjoy the action of the play um, so we decided this year to, to, well, actually about a year and a half ago to start writing a modern English adaptation of Macbeth. What an awesome challenge to take on. That's, that's awesome. Like, uh, you know, it's, it, that is the biggest stumbling block for Shakespeare, isn't it? That the actual fact, the stories are, um, in, in this particular place, uh, you know, pretty bloody, pretty, uh, yeah. pretty, uh, pretty, um, universal in terms of want like greed is something that just um hasn't really gone out of style <laughs> no no actually it was interesting because 
the more we got into it, once we cast it, we started working on it. The more we, the more they realized, the actors in, involved realized that it really is pretty applicable to even some some pretty out there stuff going on today. They, they, one of my students, when we first started talking about this, said, "Well, I don't see how this could be applicable today. It wouldn't really happen." Um, so I started having them read up on political events in North Korea. Uh, and that was enough to get their attention. And at that point, they said, you know, this this is really close to what Kim Jong-un is doing in North Korea. He's killing off people he doesn't like to hold his power. And then it started to become a little more real to him that it, it actually could be happening today. And uh, there's, you know, there are situations where stuff pretty equivalent to it is, you know, they are happening today. Um, so it was, it, was, it was quite a challenge. Uh, we did modernize it, um, used guns instead of swords and daggers. We did have some knives and, and knife fights at the end and that kind of stuff. Um, but we decided to do it that way. And that, that way it really did feel like it was an adaptation and not just, hey, we're going to take his script and set it modern day and, and go with that. Well, um, that's, thought, that's hard. Like that, not in, you can't even really do that because like you have to, because his, this, the way the language is all set up, you can't just yeah. plunk in the new words and go, hooray, it's all, it'll work. You need to, yeah. you need to finesse. Did you, Absolutely. did you put it into a, a location that would be more, um, the people could connect to more? Uh, not, we, we really didn't change the location a whole lot. We, we did use, um, instead of Thane, because nobody really knows what that means, uh, we actually, we pulled some terminology actually from North Korea. Uh, a lot of their soldiers, they refer to as marshals instead of generals or whatever. So we actually had the marshal of Fife instead of the Thane of Fife because they didn't have any idea what Thane meant. Um, we had a uh, um, master um, instead of king because they don't, you know, they refer to their highest levels as, as, you know, the master or, you know, great leader or something like that. So we tried to pull some of that into it, uh, but we didn't give it a real specific setting. We still left some of the Scotland references in um, just because it was really hard to change that and it makes sense. But uh, we did try and keep a lot of the rhythm, especially in the witches. Uh, we tried to keep the rhythm of their speech because I felt like, you know, the, the double, double toil and trouble, even if we didn't have it exactly their wording, it, it, it flowed and it had that kind of incantation feel to it. So we, we did try and do that. Um, and I will admit, I got two English teachers who have taught it for a number of years to help me with it. <laughs> so um, they, they did quite a bit to help me update it without changing the meaning or the flow of it too dramatically, uh, which was good. Yeah, that's another challenge, making sure that it's it still has to be uh, Macbeth, doesn't it? Yeah. And people get very defensive of that play. I was surprised. You know, I had, um, I, I have some people around here that I've known for years that said, oh, you're not going to modernize it, are you? And I said, well, kind of, <laughs> because they, they get very defensive of that play for whatever reason. It was, well, you don't touch that one, you know, just that kind of reaction. But we got a very, very positive response. We actually did a, um, an in-school performance for our, for our students um, for a very minimal amount. I think it was $2 a ticket. Um, now, given they did get out of school, out of class for two hours, so that was a bonus for them. But we had a number of them that came up to me and told me that um, they were right in the middle of Macbeth when they came to see it. And they really didn't understand it until they saw it. And then they could go back and the language made sense, which that, that was what our goal was, was to give them the opportunity to understand the story. So then they could focus on the language without being so confused by well, the, the plot. Well, that sounds like uh, a, that sounds like a success to me. That sounds really great that they were able to connect one version to to another. Yeah, yeah. Well, and uh, it, and yeah, financially it was a success too because we got we were able to get a grant for it um, for an arts and education grant, and that covered all but about eighty dollars of the production itself, um, which was great. All of our backdrops were done with digital images. We had projections. Uh, built a platform, and it almost had the feel of the globe, how you have the platform and then, you know, some performance areas around it. Uh, that was kind of unintentional, but it ended up really nice working that way. Uh, but it was one of the first plays. I've, I've been at Pickens High School for three years. This is my third year there, and actually before that I did special education for eight. So this is, it was a dramatic change um, three years ago, but this is the first play that we've had any major um, major income from. Because we, you know, we don't get a budget from year to year. Whatever we make is what we have for next year, and uh, there hasn't been a whole lot to come in over the last 
actually probably 10 years. Um, so it's really nice that we have something to start with next year because this worked. <laughs> it gave us a little bit of a buffer to be able to start some cool stuff next year. That's awesome. So what's on the what's on the plate for next year? Uh, well, we're going to do a couple different things. We're doing a we're doing a one act at Christmas, which we don't typically do because there's so much going on at Christmas. But uh, I found one that I really like. We're going to work on it, and it takes place in World War II um, in a cabin in France, and it's called Not on This Night. And uh, it's a, a young lady who is the only one left in her family in her house. And as she's trying to put something together for Christmas, a German soldier comes in and she's terrified of him, but it ends up working out to where they, they get along with well, an American soldier comes in and is trying to hide. So it's this, you know, it's Christmas. We're not going to fight, but we're enemies kind of thing. And it deals with that whole dynamic. So it looks very interesting. Um, and then actually for our spring production, we're doing one called three murders and it's only Monday. Um, <laughs> A, a very, very funny show. I was actually in it about five years ago at a local theater. Um, and it, it takes place in a sanitarium. And it's a spoof on the old film noir murder mystery kind of thing. So dramatically different than what we did this year. Um, but I figured after something as heavy as Macbeth, you need to kind of go the total opposite to get, get some levity in there. You know, get some, get some comedy in there and have a change. Well, Daniel, it sounds like it sounds like that this challenge was uh, was was wonderful, and I like I think that um, and I think it's really great to kind of put that stuff out there because I know that we have listeners who are in the who are in the same boat who kind of go, well, I could never do that in my area, or my you know my community would never accept it, or um, my students would never accept it, and maybe sometimes you just have to bite the bullet and and take a chance. Yeah. Well, and I figure even if it doesn't work out perfect, you've gotten it out there. And, and I think, you know, if you have any of your students that are going on to a college or a professional, they're going to be exposed to that classical theater. And, and even if it's not a, you know, huge success, they still need to know how to approach those classic Shakespearean or even, you know, Sophocles or any, any of that kind of stuff, because they're going to see it in college. And if, if we're not giving them an opportunity to see a little bit of it in high school, then we're, we're really kind of, we're, we're, we're short selling them, you know, we're, we're uh, short changing them and we're not giving them a full exposure to what theater is. So even if that was the, the primary goal, I mean, my students, we had 19 in the cast and uh, they, they really enjoyed it. The, the young lady that I put in is Macbeth or Lady Macbeth, excuse me, um, had never done it last. The last role she played was Lucy in, in your good man, Charlie Brown. <laughs> so it was a, a real challenge for her, but it pushed her and she, she did an outstanding job. Um, so I think, these Shakespearean roles can be such a challenge as an actor or actress. And if we don't give them that opportunity, then we're, we're really kind of cheating our, our students a little bit by not letting them have a chance to do something like that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Daniel. Thank you very much. All right. Now I am talking to Troy Taylor. Hello, Troy. Hey, how are you? I am all right. How are you doing? Doing well, doing well. Doing well, doing well. Uh, busy as always, right? Always. We <laughs> never seem to stop, nor do we ever have enough time in the day to get everything done. <laughs> That's every drama, te- every drama teacher I talk to. It's just like, yep, that treadmill, that time thing just doesn't, when does that, when does that work out? But, uh, but that's kind of what we're in the middle of talking about today. We're talking about uh, challenges and uh, successes. So let's talk about um, what's been your big challenge this year. Um, I would have to say that our big challenge has been the size of our program. Um, we started almost three years ago with about 30 kids, and now we're at 200. Wow. Um, and just trying to accommodate the the rapid growth of our program as well as meet the needs of our students um, and, you know, just creating opportunity for them. That's the best way to, to see a program succeed is to create opportunity for your students and just trying to keep up with all that. It's the hardest thing, eh, that the, you want to grow and you want to have the, a, a, a large program, but then there's also the, well, what do we do with everybody? Right. So how have you dealt with it? Um, well, we've been very fortunate to have a couple of um, English teachers come in on the back end of our program. So, um, and I have unfortunately had to take on the role of technical director completely because the, the people that are a part of our program now on the adult end don't have that experience. So they've been able to help me direct, but at the same time trying to run the program and just make sure that 
we're meeting the needs of every show, every kid, every competition, um, you know, financially as well as just time wise. Um, and so, um, you know, we're not there yet. We're still learning. It's a, it's definitely some birthing pains for us, but, um, I would say the biggest challenge is just being able to make sure that we, you know, we're covering every detail. And it always seems like we leave a few to fall through the cracks at the end of every process. So you do what you can, right? Right. Definitely. Okay. So what's been, uh, what has been your busi- biggest success this year? Um, I, you know, I don't know if this sounds strange or not, but I would say that our biggest success has been the challenges. Huh. Um, the challenges that have been put before us because most drama teachers usually uh, have to do everything themselves, even with no matter how big their program or how small their program. And we've been very fortunate to not have to do that. But at the same time, it's a huge learning process. And I think that's been one of the biggest successes because it's teaching us, teaching me, especially as the program director, that there's still so many things to, to look for, to pay attention to, to make sure that our kids are getting uh, from show opportunities to workshops to class instruction, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, so, you know, our biggest challenge is still our biggest success uh, because it forces us to learn with our kids. Well, and isn't that the, I think that would be the mark of a, of a great teacher is, is the one who never stops learning. Well, I would, I would like to think that I'm a constant learner. And if I'm not, then I definitely need to get out of the business of education. So. I love that. Okay. Well, that. thank you so much for sharing that. I really think that in, 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 in talking about, we, I'm doing a lot of talking to people about what are they, what are their challenges been and what are their successes been. I just think that's a lovely way to, to wrap it all up that the, the success is the fact that there are challenges to be had and that they need to be faced and dealt with successfully, not successfully. It's all learning, right? Right. Well, and I mean, what are we doing if we're not forcing ourselves to grow along with our kids? Awesome. I love that. Thank you so much, Troy. You're welcome. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, Troy, Julie, Daniel, Christy, and Liz. Thank you so much for taking the time and sharing your stories. Before we go, let's do some theater folk news. Okay. Is this you? Are you tearing your hair out at the thought of hearing the same monologue performed the same way for the hundredth time? Have no fear. Theater folk is here. <laughs> hey, I rhymed. Woohoo. Uh, we've got two new monologue books Standalone Monologues for Girls, and in a separate book, Standalone Monologues for Guys. Uh, they offer up new monologues specifically written for teen performers, all from published plays our plays. So they are all in a one-stop shop if you want to see the rest of the play that the monologue is from. Each monologue comes with a synopsis, staging suggestions, and a description of the moment before to help your students perform their best and hopefully keep you from going bald. Link is in the show notes, uh, theaterfolk.com forward slash episode 138. And you can always go to theaterfolk.com, check out sample pages, see what everything is about. Finally, where or where can you find this beautiful podcast? We post new episodes every second Tuesday at theaterfolk.com and on our Facebook page and Twitter. You can find us on youtube.com forward slash theaterfolk. And you can find us on the Stitcher app. You can also subscribe to TFP on iTunes. All you have to do is search for the word theater folk. And that's where we're going to end. Take care, my friends. Take care. 